Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. I want to read you something first. I'm going to pick up where I left off. So if you're listening for the very first time, you're going to be lost, and this is going to sound strange to you. It's not once you piece it all together. So take this information, but you need to review a lot of the information that I already covered. I'm in the last day series. I'm in Psalm 83, technically, but preaching out of Romans 9 right now. We're trying to find the hidden ones. And the hidden ones, and I already said it, are the Israelites. And who are the Israelites? Not the people living in Israel today. Not the Jews, which were a part of House of Judah. Let me read you something. Let us keep in mind that we are reading of that seed which was elected to carry forward the covenant. The seed that was elected to carry forward the covenant. that other part later. Let us keep in mind that we are re reading that of that which was elected to carry forward the seed, that is, that was elected to carry forward the covenant established with Abraham and his seed forever. And last time I was excluding and giving you a list of exclusions. In the past, there have been a whole series of exclusions. Exclusions from what? the seed that would carry forth the covenant. Ham and Japheth were excluded of the seed of Noah. Every family of Shem but the one line of descent to Abraham was, were excluded. Let me read that to you slowly. Every family of Shem but the one line of descent to Abraham were excluded. Of the sons of Abraham, every son but Isaac was excluded. Esau was excluded of the two sons of Isaac. But from the time of Israel, the descent had run like a river, full and bank high to the time of Christ. And there was to be another exclusion at the commencement of the Christian dispensation. All the seed of Isaac who remained out of Christ were to be excluded from the kingdom. The question is not here of salvation and eternal life, but of the, as I where I left us off last Sunday night, the vessels of honor. The vessels of honor who should carry on the ministration of the kingdom. That kingdom, according to at least this author, and I believe that it also, must have as its basis a Christian nation and a company of nations. Discussing the same thing in Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, you want to go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16? Go right ahead and then come back to Romans 9. It reads in Galatians 3, 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said it not and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. This statement is shortened by the apostle. The facts as written in full in the scriptures are, as to the Old Testament dispensation, the Lord said in his covenant to Abraham, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall begat, he begat, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And as in Isaac the seed was called in the former dispensations, so now the seed shall be called in Christ. He saith not unto the seeds, as of many, 
Go back to Galatians 3.16. But as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. This would be something like the full scriptural statement, the knowledge of which the apostle assumes. This exclusion in the Christian dispensation should leave a seed, should leave a seed from, or not from, but taken from, two branches of the Israel stock descended from Isaac. We already covered this. One, not of the Jews only, but also of the ethnon or ethnos, which translates in the Greek, nations. Of this seed should be formed that Christian nation which should be the Israel of the Christian dispensation. There is no manner of doubt as to who, where, and, who, where, and are the Jews. I don't think anybody doubts that. But who are the nations who, who are here referred to as the Gentiles? For out of these two branches of people must the, must the vessel of honor, the Israel kingdom nation, be formed. The Gentiles are not the heathen. We are saved the trouble of wondering over the matter by the fact that the Apostle Paul goes to great pains to make it absolutely clear that he is talking of the Israel which separated from Judah and dwelt as a separate kingdom in the land of Israel and which was still separate and distinct from Judah in his day. That's almost 2,000 years ago, around A.D. 60. In order to make this sure for the student of his writings, then, and by the way, and now, even more important now, I believe, he calls three witnesses as to the identity of Israel. He calls three witnesses. Of course, we're going to get to it here in a minute. The three witnesses are Hosea, Elijah, and Isaiah. Each of these witnesses gives his testimony in such a clear-cut manner that there can be no doubt and no gainsaving them. Inasmuch as the apostle puts Judah over against Israel in his day, there can logically arise no question as to an earlier fusion of Judah and Israel, either at the time of the return of the Jews from Babylon or after. Those who have been busy asserting such a fusion should have given more careful heed to the apostle's Paul clear statement and is clear proof, and thus have avoided falling into such manifest error. Inasmuch as the apostle puts forward the Israel nations as well known and outstanding, as well known and outstanding, separate alike from Judah and from the pagan world in his day, there cannot have been that absorption of Israel among the heathen nations which some other schools have contended for. In the apostles' day, there were, quote, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, in the quote. These latter were Israel of the ten tribes, distinct from the Jews, and also from the cosmo mankind in general, or the non-Hebrew world. Let us look at the proof. First, he calls Hosea. Let's just go to it. I'm just going to skip around real quick. But you can find the verses on your own at a later time, or you just want to listen to me, that's fine too. Because I don't have time to go through all the, ch the verses again, but we'll go through some. As he said it also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place which was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall be called the children of the living God. Now, if you want to follow me along with Romans, 
Start with verse 24, chapter 9. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, or the nations. And he said also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved. Which was not beloved. And her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of living God. They were loved, but then because of their continuing idolatry and sin, God divorced them. He also promised that they would be his beloved again in the future. And that's why he calls these three witnesses. Paul doesn't make any mistake. These three witnesses were prophesying to the ten tribes of the north. Well, I'll give you the examples. Hosea is one of them. We already covered that. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. How shall we be assured that Hosea was talking about the ten tribes of Israel and not the house of Judah? How could we be sure? Turn to Hosea. You can read along with me. I'm going to be in Hosea 1, 6, verse, 7th verse, 9th verse, through 11th verse. I'm just going to Go through it. You can read it long later. And God said unto him, Call her name Lul Ruamai, for I will not more have mercy upon the house of Israel. The who? The house of Israel. But I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and I will save them of the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Then said God, Call his name. Then said God, Skip along, Call his name Loamai. For we, ye are not my people, and not be of your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and shall come to pass. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children, in other words, be loved, divorced, and loved again by God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Can anything be clearer? Think about it. Can anything be clearer than the separation of the ten tribes of Israel and Judah? Hosea speaking to the ten tribes of Israel, and he also mentions the house of Judah here. And how they would be spared. And they would be spared by not some human army, which we already covered. An angel come down, came down and wiped out 185,000 of Assyrians. And it wasn't until about 130 years later when the Babylonian Empire came up and was the beast, beastly empire that was ruling in that day and then present-day Middle East, that finally conquered because Judah did go into sin also and they practiced idolatry, in some cases maybe even worse than what Israel did. It is the same ten tribes of Israel whom Paul is speaking about when he refers to Gentiles, or let's correct the translation, the ethnon or ethnos the nations, the ten tribes. He uses Hosea as a first example. I think Paul knew that people wouldn't believe that. I think Paul believed that just like today, back in his day, there'd be hardheads that refused to not separate the house of Judah and the house of Israel. So therefore, what does he do? He calls up a second witness. Go to Romans. Back to Romans 9. 
He calls up a second witness. How many people have read through these passages and really put and put these pieces together? I don't fault you, really. I fault the watchmen. They've not been doing very good in watching. For, for your sake. Isaiah... 9.27, not Isaiah, Romans 9.27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. A remnant out of that shall be saved. For he will finish the work, or literally the account, and cut short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. A short work will you make upon the earth. Interesting. What he's referring to is Isaiah chapter 10. Let's go to it. Going back and forth. Hopefully you're writing notes because I'm going through this quickly and you can review this on your own time. Isaiah chapter 10, and we've already been through these verses. From verse 5 to verse 23. It starts by saying, or reading, O Assyrian, the rod of, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send them against a hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath I will give them charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither do his heart think so, but in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. Down a few verses. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? And he deals with that. And then he continues through all the way to verse 23. Verse 23. Now, there's no doubt when he's talking to Israel and he's, when he's talking to Judah in these verses. Read it on your own time from verse 5. I don't have time tonight. To verse 23. Here, he's dealing with Judah. I preached a message on this. First example, he's dealing with Israel. Here, he's dealing with Judah. And what the Assyrians would try, but weren't successful. Even though they were successful with the house of Israel, When the Assyrian carried the war to Jerusalem against Judah, the angel of God destroyed them, all 185,000 of them, in a single night. I don't think there's any doubt when Paul speaks of the house of Israel by using the first two examples and the house of Judah. The instructions are fairly clear in the prophecy, which was written beforehand, before the Assyrians did what they did to the house of Israel, and then decades later, over a century, what would happen eventually to the house of Judah? There's no doubt. 
of which family branch these prophets were speaking to. And Paul makes it clear. That's why he keeps calling these two witnesses, or actually three witnesses, up. And the last witness, back to Romans. And read that in your own time. Because I just don't have time tonight. But I want to get to a certain point. Go back to Romans 9. Chapter 10, or chapter, not 10, chapter, Eleven. Let's skip over to chapter 11. I'll come back to these other verses. I say then, hath God has cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which is he foreknew. Wath ye, ye not what the scriptures say of Elijah? Who's an, a prophet? Who's a, Elijah a prophet to? The northern kingdom. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel. Against who? Israel. Saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down the, thine altars. And I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God? Unto him, I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then at this present time, and there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There's a remnant that haven't bowed their bowed down to whatever Baal means today. Whatever Baal mean, meant to Paul, a remnant. According to the election of grace, not works, grace. Let me read you something. Now we must make a long quotation. This matter is too important if we would make Assurance doubly sure in our reading of this portion of the epistle to the Romans. The meaning of which the apostles settles so surely by these very passages. And of course, this person is using 1 Kings to give you the whole history again. Starting with chapter 18, write that down. 1 Kings chapter 18, starting with the very first verse and the second verse. And I'll just read you the, the first verse and the second verse so you're familiar with the story. Most of you already heard it. I've preached on it many times. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Elijah went to show himself to Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. That's the northern tribes, the house of Israel again. And it jumps down to, if you jump down to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 through 24. That's 1 Kings chapter 18. Verse 17 to 24, and it gives you the st story. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Benin. Now therefore send and gather me all the is uh, Israel unto Mount Carmel. And the story continues onward. You can read it for yourself. Then you get to 1 Kings 19, and read passages 1 through 4, read the whole rest of the chapter in 18, and read, then read 1 Kings 19, 1 through 4, and that's where Ahab told Jezebel all what Elijah did. And he, she was determined to get her revenge. She was not successful. Elijah got scared. He went south. You have this small, still small voice. event and you can read all through that through the end of the chapter now these historic things happened in and to whom whom 
It is Paul that's recalling these stories to lay the foundation of who he's referring to. It happened to the ten tribes of Israel, not to Judah. The Syrian king would come to take those Israelites, the house of Israel, into captivity. And even though he would try with Judah, he was not successful. God made sure of that just as it was prophesied years before the event. These things happen that Paul recollects using the Old Testament. What we have is the Old Testament to recount the stories, to retell the stories. To lay the foundational basis of whom he's referring to, not to Judah, nor to any other heathen nation. Israel, as then and even now, was a separate nation from Judah. They had their own king, and they had their own separate government. Let me continue reading. Not, does not all this settle absolutely beyond, after reviewing all the scriptures, dispute that the ethnon or ethnos of Romans 9 and 11 named Israel, described as Gentiles, or rather as the original nations, is none other than Israel of the ten tribes. Even then become a company of nations. The three great matters which are here set forth from the prophet are as followed. In Hosea, the divorce of a ten tribe Israel as prophesied by Hosea, and as a history, and as history later records it, but with promise of redemption and final restoration. In Isaiah, and this is where I want you to review those scriptures and remember tonight in tonight's lesson that Paul recounts these Old Testament prophets to lay the basis of why he understood and why we should understood who the house of Israel and the house of Judah are and still are today or was and still are today. In Isaiah, the prophecy of the conquest of the ten tribe of Israel by Assyria as prophesied by Isaiah and as history later records it. So first we have Hosea. Let me read it again. Divorce of a ten tribe Israel as prophesied by Hosea. And as history later records it, but with the promise of redemption and final restoration. In, Eli in Isaiah, the prophecy of the conquest of the ten tribe Israel by Assyria as prophesied by Isaiah. And as history later records it. And of course, Elijah, the last example, the last witness that was called up to testify. The great, I mean, the, the great prophet of the ten tribe nation at Mount Carmel, that's being Elijah, summoned by King Ahab and the testing between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. All these are great facts in Israel's history, not in the history of Judah and not in the history of any other nation. Read that to you again so it sinks in. All these are great facts in Israel history, not that little nation that exists today, not in the history of Judah. That's Judah that exists today, and not in the history of any other nation. Thus, the identity of the Gentiles, the ethnos, ethnon, the nations, literally, the lost tribes of Israel, of the Apostle Paul in these Israel chapters is settled. They are the ten tribe Israel. I cannot fathom why preachers, seminaries cannot distinguish the two. I've researched these chapters every which way you can. 
pulled up every bit of information I could get my hands on from around the world. And it baffles me to no end why 99 and a half, let's just call it that, percent of all preachers just don't want to recognize it. And if they do recognize it, I'm sure some do, they don't want to seem like a nut because it's something different than what's taught in these seminaries, what's preached at all these churches. But yet it's so important. It's important enough for Paul to recognize it and make the distinct separation of the two houses. Now, are you starting to be able to see it yourself? If you are, I want to hear from you. I'll stop here tonight, but I'll pick up where I left off next time, God willing. I want to know if you're interested. You're starting to see this separation connection? If you are, now's your turn to talk to me.